So bomb. So bomb. You guys should get it. Yeah, you guys should get it. <laughs> Seriously though. Okay. All right. We're gonna get started. I'm I'm live recording right now. Um, we had some technical difficulties getting everyone on here, but um, when I see you guys on Wednesday too, maybe we can debrief and try to sort out what happened and and fix things. Um, so hopefully my audio is coming through okay. If you do have those bandwidth issues, cut out the video. That might help. Um, but uh, I want us to get started talking about Russell. Um, I think it helps to have the uh, document up. It's not very long. It's like four pages. So as I'm going to kind of go back through the document as we're talking through it. And if you've got, if you can like point to a particular part in the text when you're, um, when you've got a comment or something, that would be awesome for everyone who's, who's in the live stream there. Um, and really, like I was saying in class this morning, I hope you guys uh, chime in a whole lot because um, I really want this to be more of an interactive sort of thing where we paint the picture together. Um, I think from our kind of picking up from our discussion this morning, there's two core ideas that we already got down there. Hey, Alexa, you got in here. Awesome. I hope it works for you this time. Um, so two core ideas that we were that we had already kind of put on the table really quickly in the short amount of time we had to discuss it this morning. One of them was how uh, Russell was talking about philosophy working differently than other um, areas of inquiry, other sort of disciplines um, or efforts by humans to try to figure out what's true. Philosophy is doing that. Science is doing that. Other, other people are invested in truth. It's not like philosophers have a monopoly on it. But it seems to be a little different, like the rules of the game are a little different, or the expectations of what we can accomplish with philosophy are different than for some of these other disciplines. So that whole nexus of concepts like philosophy versus science or something like that, that's one idea that we can talk about. This is what you were bringing up, Daniel, uh, about the whole facts thing this morning. Um, and then the other one was what uh, I think uh, I think the name was Debbie. Um, pardon me, Debbie, if you watch this video and I got your name wrong, or I can't refer to you as Debbie because if I got your name wrong, then you wouldn't uh, recognize it. But to the person who brought up that comment this morning, um, I'll get your names eventually. I'll keep working on it. Um, this element of this idea about um, how Russell thinks that philosophy, doing philosophy, living the philosophical life is one that is has more peace in it, that it's more calm. Certainly he thinks it's more ideal uh, than if you lived a life that didn't have any philosophy in it. The person who has no tincture of philosophical uh, curiosity, um, that that life is going to be more anxiety driven or his words are feverish and confined. There's something feverish and confined about this life. So those two paths, I think, are, are those are very fruitful areas for us to have some discussion. Um, and that stuff's already on the table. And there's even more ideas from this reading uh, that we could kick around. Um, certainly, our, our sort of framework for our discussion tonight is trying to get straight on uh, what possible value can philosophy have? What's the, what's the point of studying it? Uh, why should we do that at all? That's really our topic of discussion. Um, I wanted to kind of remind you guys about how uh, I, on the syllabus, I called this week philosophical propaganda because you're getting writings by philosophers who are speaking to like the merits of doing philosophy. So it's kind of like, here's, here's a picture of how awesome philosophy is and why everyone should do it sort of thing. Um, and I put it, I, I, I kind of, I stand by the whole propaganda ish element because I want you to be critical of it. I want, I want to kind of alert you to, um, how this is something to be critical about. Um, so, um, I hope that we can maybe go there tonight as I also, I want to also remind you of like something I said this morning, which is that I don't give you guys only readings that I agree with. So I'm not in complete agreement with Russell here about what he finds valuable in philosophy or why he thinks it's worth doing. Um, and I don't know, maybe I'll throw some of my ideas in there too, but for, for where you guys are at, um, what do you uh, what do you want to kick around? What are you most interested in discussing? Either one of those two options or anything new. What do you see going on here? Uh, I was kind of I was confused on the uh, like when he's talking about like self and not self. Is he is he talking about like like what 
for the the Jungarian archetypes or something, how the self is like your true. Um, I'm trying to find it right now. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with him on that. I, I have a question that kind of leads into all the philo uh, philosophical readings. Is it yeah, like almost like go. a prerequisite for everything to be kind of poetically structured? I mean, isn't it kind of counterintuitive to the idea of philosophy for the idea not to be straightforward? Because I feel like he could have said that in a very straightforward manner that's informative, but instead it's turned into this thing that you have to kind of figure out what he's trying to say. Well, uh, that, let me let me speak to that first, actually, and then I'll get back to you, Daniel, because I, I think those things are kind of connected a little bit. Um, this this element about the poetry thing, I mean, one of the things that you guys are going to see in this class is a lot of different styles about how to do philosophy. Some of it is mo more poetic, and some of it is like 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 more heavily reliant on metaphor, um, and some of it is trying to be more technical and and like. Uh, precise in certain types of language that sounds more precise. I, some, I've got a little bit of skepticism for this. Um, I think technical sounding language is just still in large part models and metaphors. Uh, philosophy of science is, is something we're going to study during this quarter for a week. Um, and a lot of uh, philosophy of science is kind of like breaking that down and being like, okay, so we've got this like scientific sounding rhetoric that seems precise. But if we actually look at it, it's really dependent more on a kind of like poetic modeling uh, rather than um, something that's more like quantifiable or, or precise and accurate. Um, that said, I do think Russell is trying to speak as plainly and as clearly as possible. I don't think that he's purposefully trying to make it difficult to understand. Um, this notion, the, the notion of the self might just be kind of like a complicated concept. It might be difficult to get a handle on what what we mean by this abstract concept. For example, uh, I keep alluding to this first major topic in philosophy we're going to do next week, this personal identity stuff. And personal identity, like we talk about people, like as if we know perfectly what we're talking about when we talk about people. And under philosophical analysis, it doesn't become so clear. And you might say, well, I guess this whole concept of a person is really a metaphor, like a poetic metaphor that's imprecise. And we need this more like, complicated philosophical theory in order to make sense of it. Um, and I, so I, I think that um, what we count as like direct and clear, we have to be careful about. There's a lot of topics in philosophy that are very, very abstract and just take some time and familiarity with, with understanding. Um, so if we're talking about the self, I mean, what, what does uh, Russell have in mind with this? Daniel, your comment was pointing back in that sort of direction of, the kinds of comments that uh, Russell is making about the self. And I think trying to get straight on what he's talking about there would be maybe a good next step for our discussion. Um, Alexa here in the chat is saying, I think that philosophy is largely about beauty. In addition, the poetic nature of philosophy makes th some things up for slight interpretation and allows people to think for themselves. <clears throat> Certainly, there's no, uh, I would, I, I'd agree with that in the sense that there's no substitute for thinking for yourself. A philosopher is not doing a good job based on whether they've made everything clear and you aren't left with any kinds of questions or you don't have anything left to kind of figure out for yourself. Um, most of philosophy is about trying, someone's taking a stab at it, but they're not sure whether they've got a good idea on their hands or not. And we need to kind of bring critical attention to that sort of thing. And, uh, and keep sorting out like, well, what do we mean by this? If we're going to use this concept, if we're going to use this metaphor, what's happening there? Um, so I like that. I like that comment. Um, Rob keeps calling me, <laughs> uh, and I really want to get him in here. Um, let me just ask him for his email again. Sorry for the interruption. So uh, who was it that asked that question? Um, Tommy, does that kind of answer your, your question here about uh, Russell and this poetic language stuff? Uh, kind, like kind of. So I, I think I'm just like overthinking it all. <clears throat> um, so like what the self is like referring to like yourself, right? 
and then who's the not self is that like i don't i don't know so i think when he when and then, he, then, then this go ahead and then sorry uh and then like th this this like what he's talking about is this, this is philosophy like what what he's talking about is philosophy it's the, the self stuff he he is trying to talk about how the philosophical mode of engagement it has consequences for the relation of the self to the not self. Um, I, I think maybe a good starting point here is when he's talking about self, I think he, he has in mind the concept that we are thinking about when we talk about self-interest or if we talk about the ego or we talk about uh, like an extreme version like narcissism. Narcissism is like obsession with the self. Um, I think that's the kind of self that he has in mind. So the not self would be like other people, the world, truth. Um, these are things that are kind of external okay. to us. They're not they're not a direct part of our experience necessarily, but they might impinge on us through our experience. Um, when he talks about the enlargement of the self, he's talking about like, well, okay, I, well maybe I don't want to just say what I think he's talking about. What do you guys think he's talking about when he's talking about the enlargement of the self? Um, and and I'll, there's a couple people who I'm getting mics from, but the other five people that we have in the chat, feel free to chime in. Just uh, you know, <laughs> unmute your microphone and jump in. Sometimes tippity typing is a little slower response, or my lecture moves too fast to type responses in. So uh, please feel free to jump in. Josiah I'm just honestly, lost. Gaining, gaining I'm just honestly lost in this whole concept. <clears throat> so Josiah put a, a chat. In open, just... I'll get, get to you in a second, Tommy. Um, Josiah says perhaps just gain, gaining a larger perspective. Um, and I think that's certainly um, Russell's talking a lot about this enlargement of self in terms of knowledge. He thinks that when I know more about reality and what's going on in the world, that I'm be I have become a kind of bigger person. Cameron, you're thinking the same thing. Yeah, I think I think Russell's yeah, got that, that happening sense. in him. Yeah, knowledge or perspective. Yeah. What were you gonna say, Tommy? Um. Yeah, I was just gonna say I'm lost in this whole everything about this. So I, I'm not. I'm just gonna kind of listen mostly okay that's fair if you want to do that um, i also uh yeah but that, that made sense what they said about how it's knowledge because it he does bring up knowledge a lot in that paragraph yeah and then like and then not self is like like knowledge you can't attain like um what does he say like space and time uh world of universals i don't know so just like stuff crazy stuff <laughs> <laughs> So here, I'm looking at the, the paragraph where he's talking about this. Um, the true philosophical uh, philosophic contemplation, on the contrary, finds its satisfaction in every enlargement of the not-self, in everything that magnifies the objects contemplated and thereby the subject contemplating. Everything in contemplation that is personal or private, everything that depends on habit, self-interest, or desire, distorts the object, and hence impairs the union which the, intel in which the intellect seeks. Um, part of what's going on in this paragraph, uh, let, let me, I can fill you in a little bit on what's happening here, like some of the background. Uh, this chapter comes from a book that Bertrand Russell wrote for uh, undergraduate students in philosophy, like a 101 sort of class. And this is chapter seven, I think, something like that. Let me, I can pull it up. Uh, chapter 15. <laughs> Uh, the Plato's book seven, but yeah, chapter 15 of this book. So he's already been talking about some other things. And in particular, he, he kind of has an ax to grind against a certain type of philosophy, which has been around for a very, very long time. There's been a kind of a strain in philosophical thinking that's more focused on uh, the subjectivity of human thought and human reason and how when we're trying to understand reality, we're really just kind of projecting our own subjectivity. So the, what the philosopher is really doing is coming to an understanding of the self when they study the world. And Russell's kind of like, he thinks that's backwards. 
that if we're uh, focusing on our own subjectivity, then we're not really like opening ourselves up to reality. And this is a point that some philosophers are definitely going to argue with Russell. In certain ways, I want to argue with him on this kind of point, um, that uh, there is the, the kind of dynamic that he's talking about, the growing of the self, uh, can happen through the studying, the inward study, the like self-reflective journey of understanding human subjectivity can also be an enlargement of the self. Um, but it, there is this kind of like attitude that I think Russell's getting at regardless of how being a truth seeker means kind of wanting to open up past what you already understand. And because philosophy is this kind of critical project, this critical truth seeking, it invites that kind of growth. Uh, whereas if you're just engaging in debate to try to like justify your previously held beliefs, you're not going to have that kind of growth happening. Um, I'm getting some more comments here in the in the chat window, and I want to bring them in here. Um, uh, Alexa says that man in his natural state is ignorant and concerned with himself. However, when he loses his ego and takes in the nature of the universe without forming selfish attachment to it, uh, he can achieve true knowledge? Question mark. And th I think this is a there there is a very important element here with the ego and true seeking. Because it is really easy for my attempts to try to use my cleverness and my reason to construct a theory that is more um, where I'm more like trying to please myself or get something out of it for myself than to treat my object uh, with sincerity. I want to actually bring up in connection with this, um, Alexa, to your comment. I want to make a connection with this other passage. Um, where is it here? Um, where he talks about, doo, 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 doo. yeah, okay, this is like on the, the last, second to last paragraph, um, Russell says, the mind which has been accustomed to the freedom and impartiality of philosophical contemplation will preserve something of the same freedom and impartiality in the world of action and emotion. So Russell's basically saying that whatever attitude we take to truth seeking is going to reflect out in how we engage with the rest of our lives when we're not just like sitting and thinking and scratching our heads and having debates about these abstract things about philosophy, but when we're actually living our everyday lives. He says, it will view its purposes and desires as parts of the whole with the absence of insistence that results from seeing them as infinitesimal fragments of a world of which all the rest is unaffected by any one man's deeds. Um, this is uh, <clears throat> kind of a flowery way of talking about things. Kind of, I, maybe he is overrotting the point here uh, with the English that he's using here. But it's he's sort of like saying that when I'm considering what are the considerations that I should be using to decide what to do, I'm not just going to be stuck with uh, what are my desires as an individual in a sea of all of these other people who exist in the world who are in competition with my desires. So I'm going to think about it from a different standpoint. I'm going to see it as, as, as the desires that maybe emerge in my experience as part of a larger discussion here about what's true. So here's the key quote that I wanted to get to for you, Alexa. The impartiality, this is, this is from Russell, the impartiality which in contemplation is the unalloyed desire for truth. What he means is when you're just truth seeking and you don't have some other agenda, is the very same quality of mind which in action is justice. And in emotion is that universal love which can be given to all and not only to those who are judged useful or admirable or I would add to this like pleasing to us, like the people who we like, that we can, we can have a kind of love and compassion for humanity on a way that's not conditioned on the things that please us, you know, like the people you like. Does that make sense? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't really ask those questions in the live chat. I'm so used to the classroom where I can just be like, eh, and like get a reaction right away. But um, so wh why I wanted to bring this in for your point, Alexa, is that Russell is really uh, trying to make a connection here with my attitudes about truth seeking and these other kinds of issues that I confront as a human being, like how to live a just life and 
moral values like compassion, and also ethical issues surrounding the ego. So I think Russell thinks that if I'm just focusing on the truth, which doesn't seem like something that's going to be like a process of self-actualization. It's not like I'm like going into group therapy and gonna we're going to like talk about my emotions and feelings and work all that stuff out. But, but just by engaging in the project of sincere truth-seeking, you're developing an attitude which will have consequences into those other sorts of arenas. So I, I think Russell really does believe that philosophical truth seeking, if done sincerely, will diminish the ego. That it will it'll work on that ego. And in the process of diminishing the ego, it also kind of opens you up to being able to see more, to be able to have a kind of deeper understanding about reality. Um, do you guys have this kind of experience of like um, like the more that you're preoccupied with what's going on with yourself, it's like harder to be open. Like say, probably, probably the best example for this would be something like you're hanging out with a friend and if you're, if you've got all this stuff going on in your life, it's really hard to listen to them and like figure out what's going on in their experience because you know, you've got all these like voices and noise in your head that sound familiar. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I like to say yes. And uh, Daniel, I think you're nodding your head down there. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I want to rewind just a second. Sure. So you said the philosophic contemplation, when it's unalloyed, does not aim at proving that the rest of the universe is akin to man. Is I, I had actually written that in my notes here, and I did not understand what that meant. So is that kind of what you're talking about? Yeah. This hold that the universe is akin to man is that another reference to that kind of version of doing philosophy which is just focusing on the subjective and russell's like i said he's got an axe to grind against those kinds of philosophical perspectives um i i think his main point here about how true seeking is going to do something on like it's going to require you to not just try to project out your own experiences on the universe is right but this whole thing about um whether or not <clears throat> The reality that we experience is really just a subjective reality versus an objective reality. That's that's another kind of philosophy debate that I don't think uh, Russell maybe should get into here. Like, I I think it's kind of uh, maybe a little unfair to talk about the kinds of philosophers that have put a lot of attention on human subjectivity as not being sincere truth seekers or something like that, or they're just looking to enlarge and like be focused on the self rather than to like open up to a broader world. Uh, I, I, I think Russell's being a little unfair there. We're going to read some philosophers this quarter that, that have more of that subjectivist tinge to them. And in many ways, I'm kind of sympathetic with those perspectives too. And I think even if we're just wading in the waters, even if we're only swimming in the waters of human subjectivity, there still is a difference about whether we're doing that with curiosity, whether we're open to new ways of thinking about it, um, and maybe other people's subjective experiences rather than just our own. I also, uh, Lawrence has been typing some comments here too, and I've been kind of ignoring him because <clears throat> I've been talking about these other things. So maybe I'll, I'll pull in what he's saying. This is, uh, this is, I'm just, this is, you know, this whole class is an experiment doing these video lectures. And I have to say, this is a little more convoluted than I like normally do it in class. Um, but maybe it's just because I'm like, you know, getting these messages in different places and how to fit them in. But okay, let's see what you're saying, Lauren. Sorry to put you off this long. Um, so Lauren says, I think the self he's referring to, that Russell's referring to, is more a basis of the self as defined by the word. Self is always seen in the negative, like selfish, where selfless is the positive. Uh, to me, it's more getting away from the base nature and more toward the enlightened, non-instinctual, rational, or at times, spiritual thought. Um, that, that's an interesting point to make here, Lawrence. I, I think Russell is kind of on the same page with you. He has a lot of things to say about desire, and how um, if I'm, if he, he kind of talks about desire as like this insistent voice in me, that I, maybe I would use a metaphor of like a bully, like, um, my desire, like, demands to be satisfied. It's like this little voice in my head that's like, rawr, 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 you better do what I say, sort of thing. Uh, that's really hard to ignore. 
And if you're uh, if you're in this kind of model or habit of in your life of really making decisions based on those desires, then I think that's part of the picture of what Russell has in mind when he talks about the life of the self as feverish and confined. It's sort of like a life where you're constantly tormented by your own desires and seeking satis their satisfaction. Um, and that's kind of like an endless rat race. of. Uh, it kind of reminds me of Buddhism. Buddhism is going to say very similar things about desire. They, they talk about desire as like being in a burning flame or um, they really like this like burning house metaphor. And we're just so used to it that we don't realize what's going on. Like, like Buddhism would say like, if you just woke up and saw what you were doing right now, it would be like suddenly recognizing that you're in the middle of a burning house and then you're just going to get out. But what's weird about us is that human beings try to make a, make a home, they make a house that's on fire and try to be okay there. They, ha they try to like carve out a life that uh, incorporates this um, priority on desire and that's just like an untenable situation. And I think when, what Russell's saying about the philosophical life is that in, by prioritizing truth and reason here, this, what, what Lawrence, you talked about as the enlightened, uh, non-instinctual, rational, or at times spiritual thought. Oh, no. I think I lost the internet connection. I think you're mic'd or uh, muted. Yeah, Tim, you're muted. Oh. All right, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, there you go. Yep. I'm sorry about that, guys. I, I, my downstairs housemates must have unplugged the router or something. Um, I'm trying to use my phone as a hotspot. Is it coming through at good bandwidth? <laughs> yeah. Decent enough? It's all Gucci. Okay, cool. All right, where were we? <laughs> Decent enough. You're talking, uh, someone commented uh, something. You said you, you liked it. Oh, and I Lawrence. lost the, the chat Lawrence. history just cleared. Oh, man. Lawrence, are you still there? Oh, shit. Your, your second comment, Lawrence, that you typed up. Yeah, can you do that? That'd be great. Just copy paste it. Yeah, okay. You say, I'm in agreement with the idea of self-actualization and the diminishing of the ego helps in finding the truth. When you eliminate the desire to elevate oneself and, and competition, it makes it easier to seek the truth. Yeah, and I was talking, so I was using, that's what I was talking about. The, um, the example of um, when you're hanging out with a friend and you're really preoccupied by your own stuff, so you can't listen to them. So like the ego gets involved there and then it's harder to see what's going on. Like, um, so I, I, that's, that's something that I think Russell is really preoccupied with here and talking about like if you're focusing on listening then you're naturally going to diminish those things and as you just diminish those things those uh, preoccupations with the self then you get to see more too so there's kind of reciprocal process there um, I feel like maybe that wasn't exactly where we left off but um, uh-huh okay so Alexa saying to Lawrence philosophy does not eliminate the essence of self-interest but rather it changes it. The sincere practice of philosophy serves to elevate the mind and soul from Russell's perspective. If one wants to approach perfection mind, a key element of self, they shall question everything. Um, I wonder what you have in mind here about uh, eliminating the essence of self-interest. Um, because Russell does say in that one passage I was quoting earlier that he thinks that with the diminution of the self, there's also this move toward universal love, un like unconditional love and uh, a concern for justice, uh, which is sort of disinterested. It's like it's not trying to make decisions based off of just what fits in with my own self-interest, but it's looking at Into things from a, a more universal <laughs> kind of perspective or on a more universal playing field. What was that? Oh, and, uh, Pintar is just in here, so I was just saying, hey. Mm -hmm. Happy you found us. Or I found you, Andrew. Sorry about how late I got that email um, for the request for the invite. Um, 
So how are you? Where are you guys at here with this whole self idea from Russell? More stuff you want to kick around with that, or is it is the picture starting to come into focus? Yeah, I mean it makes more sense. I got it. it's like knowledge and kind of just growing as like a person and how you think and what you think, I guess, right? And there's this like attitude change that happens along the way. I think I think more than just like acquiring knowledge. Um, Russell's kind of interested in people's character. All right, yeah. So like, when I was when I was eight years old, I wouldn't, you know, I would think, uh, you know, Batman was awesome. But now, I mean, Batman's still awesome, but he's not like, you know, as awesome as he was. Kind of like that, I guess. I don't know. Um, but... <laughs> maybe <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about that, but. Um... Maybe something like uh, maybe sports are a good uh, analogy here. Have you ever played sports, Tommy? Yeah. And like done them like like seriously, like been on a team and like prep practice. Yeah, I played in, played in high school and some JUCO. So like if you if you maybe play a sport for an afternoon or like out at recess or something, that's not going to be the same sort of thing. But if you're like on a team and you're like having to work with being on a team. It kind of it, – it's not just, like, learning how to play the game more effectively, but it's also about, like, how your character can grow in the process, how it can be, like, um, a part of maturing to engage in that sport and to play it on a team. And I think that would be kind uh, of like, like an analogy go. with what Russell's saying about how truth-seeking, just doing that activity, like, where the goal is to get at the truth, will have this kind of effect on your character. It'll – cause you to have this different sort of attitude toward uh, life and to the world where uh, kind of like, especially I was hoping to kind of get back to here. I, I mentioned it this morning, this model of the, um, the self that's like constantly fighting against the world because it's trying to make things happen the way that it wants it to happen and changing that attitude from, from that model to one that's trying to like um, adapt the self to reality. So the self is not this insistent demand, but it's the actual like the moldable clay that you're trying to match something up, match to reality. Um, so by just seeking the truth, your character will kind of change in this in this way. Um, what year was this written? Uh, let's see. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, Russell's an earlier 20th century guy. Um, here. Maybe someone want to look it up and, and throw it in the group chat. If you just uh, Wikipedia Bertrand Russell's The Problems of Philosophy, you should be able to find it quick. I'm going to find this passage where he's uh, talking about what I was just mentioning because I wanted to read a couple things here. What's his Russell? The Problems of Philosophy. Here we go. Here's here's the paragraph that uh, I think is is this. I do like the poetry and beauty of, of Russell's writing too. I think some stuff's just uh, just gives me goosebumps. Um, okay, so this is one of oh Lawrence, you got something to add here. Before I read this quote, I'm going to read what Lawrence just said. If that is his interpretation, then I don't fully agree with it. I think the pursuit of knowledge and enlightenment can come and may at times require uh, at the can come at the loss of self, in that a person no longer has self-interest or places themselves before others, but seeks knowledge without causing an expense to others or without doing it for selfish motives. It's hard to explain some levels of self, as for me, self includes the animalistic nature of the body, which is innately selfish. Um, Lawrence, that sounds a lot to me. What you're saying sounds a lot like Russell to me. Uh, can you clarify what's the it in your, if, that's, if that it, uh, is his interpretation? What's the that that you're referring to? That was towards, uh, oh, Alexa's comment. Um, oh, okay, back to when Alexa was mentioning 
um, how philosophy doesn't eliminate the essence of self-interest but changes it. Uh, okay, okay. And then Alexa says, I meant that one greatly does serve himself by seeking the truth. Um, okay, here's here's something that both of you guys might like. And and actually for uh, future live stream things, um, I'd, I'd like it if we can have the conversation happening like within the space where I'm kind of lecturing and talking about things rather than like me doing a lecture and then there's kind of this like sidebar discussion going on at the same time in parallel because I want to... I want to integrate those elements. I, I I want the chat to kind of be like if you raised your hand in class and said something and we all had to listen to it all at once, and then we can kind of be on the same page. I, I that's kind of what I'm thinking right now as a as a good model. Um, but in terms of this kind of discussion you guys are having about whether it means the loss of the self or whether it's changing the self or something like that, um, maybe a, a like a parallel debate that this reminds me of is the debate between Buddhism and Hinduism. Because in Hinduism, the language and the, the metaphor is much more about enlarging the self, which is more like the language that Russell is using in, in, in places in this reading, about how the, the self becomes more expansive um, uh, by encountering knowledge and reality and this sort of thing. Um, and Buddhism uses much more the language of no self, self-denial, reducing the self, getting rid of the ego, not making it bigger, but diminishing it. And, and this is where we got to be careful with our metaphors and what we're taking them to mean. Because in many ways, I see uh, what Hinduism talks about with enlarging the self as very, very similar to what Buddhism is trying to go through with reducing the self. And I, I think you can kind of see those both of those uh, conceptual um, metaphor metaphorical languages kind of coming to a head in Russell. Sometimes he's talking about the diminution of the self, Sometimes he's speaking about the enlargement of the self, but the biggest thing seems to be, and it, this is my two cents, my advice about how to work it out, that um, the, the, the problem here that we'd be worried about is if the self is dictating terms for reality, whether it's being like, it's plays by my rules, which I make up and I decide. Even the enlargement of the self as like Russell talks about it, or how Hindu, Hinduism talks about, means an encounter of the self with the not-self. The not-self has to be experienced, it has to be listened to if the self is going to grow from that encounter. Um, so it can't be like prioritizing its reality over what it's trying to encounter, or you won't be able to really have a genuine, authentic encounter with that. Um, Alexa says, what's the point of having knowledge if you have zero sense of self? Um, so, uh, here, here's another thing I have to offer with this. This is becoming a big discussion about the self, but I, I think that's okay. Um, that's a big part of what's happening with Russell and just about knowledge in general. Um, I think there might be a couple different notions of self that we might, might, uh, want to distinguish from each other. One notion of self is like, you are a person. Like you are an individual. Another notion of self is sort of like the self as a concept that I, I when I think about reality in general, I'm like, well, there's a lot of things that exist, and I'm one of them. So um, there's like self in the sense that I am an individual that encounters the world from an individual perspective, and then there's like I'm a thing that exists alongside other things in reality. These are two different types of concepts. And I could be, I could recognize that I have a self in the sense of being an individual without necessarily automatically being a narcissist, right? Like even a narcissist or a non, uh, someone who doesn't struggle with narcissism, both people are individuals. Like it'd be absurd to say the person who's not a narcissist is not a person or doesn't have a self or something like that. Um, but I think, and, I, and so I think Russell's way more concerned about the kind of self that'd be like the narcissistic self, the self-obsession sort of thing, rather than uh, just like being an individual, being a person at all. Uh, Lawrence says, uh, as Tim is getting at, I think there are two forms of self where one is individual and one is more a part of the person that is not a separate entity but a segment or ideological outlook. Yeah, that may, might be another good way to put it. Um, Sadly, I lack the words to describe it properly at this time. 
you guys, this is the, the stuff we're struggling with tonight in the lecture about this, what is the self and that sort of thing. I mean, get ready, because this is a huge part of philosophy. It's just being like, here's a concept. What the hell are we talking about? How do we articulate it? Just getting straight on the topic at hand is a huge chore in itself. And that's one of the major uh, obstacles or problems of philosophy is just like getting our terms straight to begin with. Um, so I hope you have some patience with that. Um, it's worth the payoff. <laughs> uh, but it is, it's, it's something that takes maybe got a slow payoff kind of like uh, the sports metaphor I, I like sports metaphors for lots of things uh, if you, you can't just like show up to practice one day and be like have a life-changing experience and become a totally different person I mean maybe that happens maybe it happens in a couple cases but a lot of um, the real benefits of doing like being involved in team sports or something like that is like the long slow work of development on it and a lot of stuff in this class is going to feel like uh, maybe like we're just scratching the surface and the best is yet to come or something like that. I definitely, in my experience of philosophy, if this is, whole week is about like the value of philosophy and everything, it just gets better and better. The more you do it, the more encounter you have with philosophy, the more you think about these ideas and have these discussions, they just get richer and richer and richer and, and um, there's more to enjoy. Uh, it's, um, gosh. Uh, now I'm just gushing. Now I'm just being a fanboy, so I'll cut that out. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, there was a, a hanging thread from a little while back that I wanted to come back to um, about this whole self thing. It's it's one of, I think, the best passages of the whole writing. I wanted to make sure we took a look at it before we left here uh, tonight, left Russell behind. Um, so I'm pulling it up on my screen here. Uh, this is on page, what is it? Um, page three. It's the paragraph that starts apart from apart from its utility. Um, so Russell says here, the life of the instinctive man is shut up within the circle of his private interests, and the instinctive man is like someone who's like being ruled by desire that like operates from desire is not necessarily doing this whole like critical reasoning thing, the um, rational truth-seeking as a way of trying to make decisions about what to believe and what to do, how to act. So the life of this person, the instinctive person, is shut up within the circle of private interests. Family and friends may be included, but the outer world is not regarded except as it may help or hinder what comes within the circle of the instinctive wishes. So it's like your attitude to reality is a constant war. It's like are you helping me or are you hurting me? Are you my friend? Are you my ally? Are you my enemy? Everything is in this kind of framework. And Russell says, in such a life, there's something feverish and confined, this uh, quote I keep referencing, in comparison with which the philosophical life is calm and free. The private world of instinctive interests is a small one, set in the midst of a great and powerful world, which must, sooner or later, lay our private world in ruins. Unless we can so enlarge our interests as to include the whole outer world, we remain like a garrison in a, believer, in a beleaguered fortress, knowing that the enemy prevents escape and that ultimate surrender is inevitable. In such a life there is no peace but a constant strife between the insistence of desire and the powerlessness of our will. In other words, the way in which we can't get what we want. Like, desire is like, Give me this thing. And we're like, I'm trying, but I can't. In one way or another, Russell says, if our life is to be great and free, we must escape this prison and this strife. Um, I, I, I think this is, a, this, is, this is kind of a lot of what Russell wants to say in a nutshell about um, in, in philosophy, you kind of like give up on this friend or foe sort of thing, the enemy ally framework. You're just like, What's going on? I'm like cooperating. I'm in a um, cooperative, collaborative mode with everything that, that comes across my path, everything that shows up in my life. Um, do you guys, uh, uh, maybe, maybe you have this kind of experience. Um, I could kind of relate to this. Um, 
do you remember ever and maybe you feel this way right now too i mean maybe, i i certainly uh had this like uh experience in high school where i was a little like preoccupied for a little while with this game of like the like kind of the popularity game it's just like do people like me do they not like me like how do you like please people this kind of people pleasing sort of thing like how, what are what do they care about like how, if I do this, is it going to cause a problem, or is it going to make some benefit happen? Are you guys familiar with this sort of thing? That whole like war of of uh, social relationships and and carving out yeah. like a social life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have it like right now, and I'm like, should I say something? Should I not say something? Yeah, it's like, yeah. Yeah. And there may have been a moment, I, I had this moment with it in high school, where I was like, fuck this, I'm done. I'm done with this crazy game. This game is stupid. Uh, I'm sick of being, like, tormented by oh, yeah. always looking over my shoulder and thinking, if I, like, do this sort of thing, or if I am this sort of personality, if I say these sorts of things, if I try to interact in this sort of, sort of way, what are people going to think of it? Um, that kind of, like, when when you when you're operating in that mode, you're like giving power to other people's opinions and what they think of you as like controlling your life. And that's what Russell's trying to say about our own desires. That they have that same kind of that they're 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 like um that insistence that desire has, uh that our instincts have, uh kind of rules us. And it's not a happy way to live. <laughs> that's kind of his point about it. Um and that when you start playing the, the sincere truth-seeking game, when you, like, ask the question, what do I think is really good? Like, what's actually ideal? Um, then you're kind of open. You're like, maybe it's not what my desires are telling me. Maybe it's not anything of what these demands that I'm – all these voices in my head that are telling me different things need to be right or wrong. I kind of, like, set all that stuff aside. I lay it all down. And I'm just like, okay, well, what's going on? Let's listen to it. I'm not going to hold any expectations or stakes. Things don't need to go the way that I want them to go. I just need to listen to what's out there. And it's the same kind of like sense of relief as like when I gave up that uh, playing that social game in high school. And I stopped caring what people thought. I started wearing crazy clothes and talking about philosophy all the time. And I was like, I don't care whether you want to hear about this or you think I'm a nerd or whatever else. I was like, I'm just going to do it and, and it, there's a kind of peace in there and like giving up that baggage giving up that that struggle i think that that might yeah. be a, a way to get imaginatively into russell's mind <clears throat> being true to yourself that that is a very interesting phrase tommy being true to yourself um actually alexa uh, alexa and i were talking about this this morning too before class um Especially considering it from Russell's point of view with the whole self thing, right? Being true to yourself. Yeah. Um, I think Russell might want to say uh, being true to the world rather than being true to yourself. That, like, yourself is the problem. He might say something like that. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. I mean, Russell is definitely in terms of the philosophical method is, like, not taking that stuff for granted about – uh, not trying to find truth by looking inside, but through like looking outside, trying to listen to what's not you or not how you currently experience things. Um, on this point, I mean, this can be a sticky point where you're like, well, ah, man, it's so like hard to like set aside your own experience and everything like that. Um, I was talking with some other student about this today outside of class too. And I want to share with you guys what I, what I said to him. I said, Experience can be as much of a force of bias as it can be just evidence. Like your experience, don't, you know, I've said in class, like, I don't care about your opinion. Like your opinion doesn't count for shit. And in, in when it comes to a rational, critical inquiry about the truth, it's all about the arguments and defending it. But your experience doesn't just have to be the truth maker all on its own. Don't, don't discredit your experience. Your experience has like, shown you different realities it's put different um ideas on your radar and maybe if other people didn't have those experiences they wouldn't be like automatically put on their radar either but you can share we can learn from each other's experiences i don't like 
need to have your experience to learn from you and be able to understand maybe what you're saying. It might be harder to understand because I don't know it for myself uh, intimately, but I can definitely learn from it. I can still make allowances for uh, what your experience has pointed out to you. So this there's a kind of weird balancing act here of like, like Russell's worried about prioritizing to the self where it becomes a bias. But at the same time, your experience is something you can hold from a more universal point of view. You don't have to give it all the power. You can um, just treat it as like, well, that's one experience alongside many others. And I want to listen to everyone's experience too to get a fuller picture here when I'm trying to in inform what kind of conclusions I want to draw. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? Makes sense. Uh, thanks, Andrew, for the nerds Thank rock thing. <laughs> I'll have to bring my camera out. You have to see my uh, board game collection sometime. I'll probably set up <laughs> for the time. It's kind of it's kind of out of control. Um, I want to just check in. I think with Andrew, Andrew, Andrew wanted to say something. I think. Oh yeah. Yeah. Come on, Andrew, speak up, dude. <laughs> uh, I guess he didn't want to say it. I guess. That's okay. No. <laughs> he, he, I was just about to actually invite people who have been like, uh, that I haven't heard from yet tonight. If you wanted to jump in and ask any questions, I think we should probably wrap up soon. I'm at 51 minutes on the recording and we've been hanging out for like over an hour. Um, yeah, I gotta do math homework too. Yeah. What, any, any, what else are you guys thinking? I've been talking a lot too. I want to make some space. Uh, I have a lot of stuff to say about the Play-Doh one. I, I just didn't. I hated it. But, I mean, we're talking about the Russell one right yeah, now. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the Play-Doh on Wednesday night's lecture. All uh, right, yeah. But, um... I don't know if anyone else is going to expand on that. I don't know. I think that the whole philosophic argument is entirely human and human alone. And so that relinquishing more than oneself is you know, again, counterintuitive to the whole idea of, you know, forming thoughts. I, I think that us as humans are pretty much the only ones that experience this as we experience reality. And so it's, it's unique to us. Without oneself, that plane doesn't exist. I don't know if it's a philosophy or if it was a study, but um, I'm probably going to poorly paraphrase it. But that whole idea, if you know, there's a cat and it's inside of a box. Mm. As long as it's inside that box and you don't see it, it doesn't exist. But then once you reveal it, it actually comes into existence. And that's kind of my thought on philosophy is that, you know, philosophy, you know, the study of the thought itself is is really, I lost my train of thought, but you're, you're are you bringing following, the you know? Schrodinger's cat thing. The Schrodinger's cat metaphor, right? Yeah. Cat in the box. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm. Uh, I, I. I'm gonna. I'm gonna not touch the Schrodinger's cat metaphor. Maybe we'll talk about that some other time. But I. What I'm hearing, um, Daniel, is that you're kind of on that um, subjectivist wavelength of like the study that we're doing is really learning about humanity. That when we seek the truth, we're really coming to more of a self understanding. Then we are understanding a world that's apart from us. Is that am I on the right track here? That's exactly what I mean. We're we're not really truly uh, experiencing the world as it really exists. We're just finding out more about how we understand. Yeah, the world. right. There's a that's the long-standing philosophical tradition cool. that Russell is kind of opposed to. That one that I was saying he has an axe to grind against. Um, I actually and and that's the one that I also have deep sympathies with. Uh, one way to put this would be maybe idealism. This is a philosophical p perspective or family of views that are kind of along these lines. Even Plato says that like like a, when, when Plato makes his academy, first ever philosophical school way back in ancient Greece, um, it's all about like know thyself. That's like the major thing here. Um, like have self-awareness, self-recognition, that that's a part of the journey. Um, Buddhism is very uh, sympathetic with this too, because Buddhism is all about like reorienting the attention from trying to control external circumstances to working on yourself and your internal circumstances. Um, the idea that we never get at reality as it is in itself, those, that phrase you use, that comes from Kant. Kant talks about 
things in themselves and and that we don't have access to them directly and that all we get is experience every every encounter with reality that we have is mediated through experience so whenever we're learning anything we're really just learning about human experience and how we have to subjectively think about things and this and this is where i want to just re-emphasize my point that i think a lot of what russell's trying to say is still compatible with those kinds of philosophical perspectives that the the attitudes that he sees the uh involvement in philosophy as cultivating that's positive for human beings i think even someone who's got this subjectivist bent can sympathize with and can accept that it doesn't just have to be with this model of like me external world i need to focus on this and ignore this in fact i think that'd be kind of like a maybe an oversimplification of what russell's trying to say even for his own like deeply realist uh stance about about these subjective realities Do you, what do you what do you think of that, Daniel? I, I can agree with that. I mean, I can agree with his, you know, saying that we still need to separate ourselves emotionally, or else we can can't look at things on bias. You know, I, I believe that there's a a certain kind of structure he's trying to say that's helpful to being um, philosophic, and I think that's applicable no matter whether you're subjective or not. Yeah. To the whole idea yeah. of the reality and what you're actually experiencing. So I, I'm still taking things from it, but not necessarily agreeing with it, you know, mm -hmm. fully. No, that's fair. I, 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 I'm uh, happy to kick around stuff with you guys here in this forum. That's, that's like my favorite thing about running this class is like, there's certainly, I'll, I'll do a lot of like defending the philosophers that we're reading. Uh, when you guys bring criticisms, I'll try to like speak on their behalf and that sort of thing. And I, I do want to make it clear that I'm not like that doesn't happen with the expectation that I'm just trying to get you to agree with them or that I expect that you should agree with them or or something like that. Um, so, yeah. Oh, the code word. That's right. I got to come up with the code word for tonight. Um, you guys ready for the code word? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, what should be the code word tonight? Um, turn up, turn up, turn up. Turn up? Yeah, turn up. All right, fine. Turn up the bass. Turn up, there it is. Right. Turn rip? <laughs> cool. <laughs> turn up. All right, turn up's the code word. There we go. Um, maybe I, I want to say, I want to give another shot at this, Daniel, with, with this whole subjectivist thing. Um, and the attitude. I'm saying, like, this attitude element about self and not self that Russell's trying to go for, maybe under the subjectivist framework it would look like this. Um, okay, so let's say I believe all of reality is just coming through experience. I never get to learn it re about reality in itself, all but on its own, in itself. Um, I don't, I only get contact with what's sort of the human reality, and that's what I'm learning about. Even within that domain, there's like the human condition, which me right now is realizing only one facet of. And there's other possibilities for like what a human can be. You guys are also unique expressions of what is the like human possibility. And in one Oops. person's lifetime, they're like exploring different elements of this, different diverse facets of what being human can mean. And for me to have a broader, deeper understanding of just human subjective reality means being open to understanding those other possibilities. Um, and that's, I think, very, very close to what Russell is trying to say and what he's trying to express in this writing. Think about how he says um, a lot of philosophy's value comes not from answering questions, but in showing us what are the other possibilities. Like, what are the things that are out there um, that, what are the other ways of thinking about these questions? Um, and in kind of keeping those other possibilities open, it keeps us curious and searching and that sort of thing. So maybe maybe that helps that to see that, like, there there's a way in which uh, Russell's points can translate into the subjectivist framework, I think, without too much distortion. Yeah, I, I believe that, but I also, you know, don't get me wrong, I don't think being subjective automatically has to mean that you don't think that it's important 
to um, see the human perspective. Yeah. You know, just because I, I might feel that that's not the real reality doesn't mean that this one doesn't have any importance. I don't, I don't believe that. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm kind of saying is that like there's, there's kind of like a external world, if you will, of human subjectivity. And that's – even if we're like that's all we get and that's super duper valuable, um, I can still be like curious about that <laughs> or not curious, right? I could be like, no, nah, I'm cool with my expression of human condition right now. And I don't need to try out anything new or listen to anyone else's experience or something like that. Like, I, I think it's that kind of attitude that, that Russell's targeting. You will have to, at one point, let me know what you think about the cat in the box theory, though. <laughs> oh, Scherzinger's cat. <laughs> I do want to hear that. Uh, yeah, and, and the, and the quantum, quantum mechanics and stuff like that. I mean, there, yeah. Yeah, that, that's something I'm not going to get into here. We should talk outside of class sometime about that because that's a big, long tangent. Uh, that I'm not going to subject people to on YouTube, <laughs> if, unless they want it. Uh, if, anyone out there watching this video or, or on the live stream, if you want to talk about uh, quantum mechanics and philosophy, we can do that sometime. That's a big can of worms or a big cat in a box. I'd be down. I'd be down if I didn't have math homework. Yeah. <laughs> Alexa says. All right, but I'm gonna. Uh... I'm gonna get off because I gotta I gotta do some other homework, but uh, okay, sounds good. And we should probably sign cool? off. We should call it a wrap. I just crossed the hour threshold on the video, so let's uh, let's call it good for tonight. If you guys, I I told you guys before that um, you know we're gonna go through material and we're never gonna feel like it's fully satisfied by the time we have to move on. Case in point, I feel like there's a lot more we can talk about here. I'm always free to talk. I'm talking with students every day after class at 9:30. Um, and later in the day too. So if you want to meet and talk to me outside of class, I love it. Love it. Look me up, call me, text me on the phone. You don't even need to make an appointment. Just drop in. As long as I'm not teaching, I'll talk to you. So have a good night, everyone. Take it easy, guys. Peace.